Hello, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending on wherever you are attending this from. My name is Shekhar Sanyal and I want to welcome you to this extraordinary webinar that we are doing today for the digital conversations called Getting India Inc. Back on Track, a Future Tech Perspective. This is brought to you by the Future Technologies panel of the IET and we will be discussing a whole lot about what we, I, in the Indian ecosystem as well as the uh, India Inc, so as to say, should do as we move into this new uncertain or new kind of future. So before we start off, uh, we ha I'd like to thank Sri Suresh Prabhuji, who has joined us today as a special guest, as a guest of honor, and will give a keynote, plus a whole host of luminaries from the in India industry world who will be there, and I will introduce you to them as we go along. But let me start by talking a bit about the IET. IET, or the Institution of Engineering and Technology, is a professional society for engineers, which is actually going to celebrate its 150 years from October this year. So we have been around, as you can see, for quite some time. And we have been working uh, in the engineering space, working with engineers. Our vision is working to engineer a better world. So we create a platform which is neutral, which allows engineers to come together and try to solve problems which are of national importance or international importance. Uh, in India, we have been around, our members have been around for the last uh, 75 years or so. The IIT is actually headquartered out of the UK. Uh, uh, it started in 1871. As I told you, we are celebrating 150 years as the Society of Telegraphic Engineers. Then became the institution of in electrical engineers, and finally the Institution of Engineering and Technology. It's one of the largest in engineering institutions currently in the world. Uh, our focus areas, uh, the way we work in the IIT is essentially take engineers to make sure that we are solving problems. We have about 180,000 members spread across 127 countries around the world. In India, we have got about 13,000 members who are working with us to create, as we say, a better world and a better India. We focus on three, four areas in India. Uh, one area is essentially engineers and engineering education. So we do a lot of work with engineering universities and colleges to help them go up the value chain. We work with students, we work with teachers, we work with the uh, in institutes themselves. Uh, we also do uh, are one of the uh, academic accreditation bodies uh, globally. So we also do a benchmarking accreditation of engineering courses uh, as, as and when invited. On the other side of it, we have three thought leadership platforms that we uh, work on. This essentially allows engineers to come together and solve problems which are important to India's growth as a country. So our first uh, platform is the future technologies platform. This essentially focuses on the technologies of the future, which has got huge impact on the growth of this country. Uh, I will invite in a little while uh, the chair of the Future Technologies panel to talk a bit about it and the genesis and the growth of it from where it came from. The second area that we focus on is future of mobility and transport, which is again extremely important for the growth of India as a country. And finally, uh, amalgamation of both these two things become the future of work. How transport is going to change the way we work. We are already seeing all of us currently across, most of us are actually doing this webinar from home. So which means we are working from home. So the future of work is changing as we speak and it's got accelerated by this pandemic. So the IIT's focus on future of work has been there for the last year and a half. And that's something that we also work on. That is what we do. We bring out advisories, we bring out white papers, we do conferences like this. The whole idea is how do you take, uh, create a platform where people can come together and impact the change that is required. So that is what I want to talk about the IT. IT is a membership organization. If you would like to be part of this work that we are doing, I would encourage you to become a member of the IT so that we can get your inputs and your support to do this work as we go forward. Uh, you could go to our website, uh, theiet.in is where you need to go and you can get all details about uh, the work that we do in India. 
globally, if you would like to know more about what we do, you can go to the IET.org. That is T-H-E-I-E-T dot O-R-G or T-H-E-I-E-T dot E-D. So that's what I wanted to say before we started off, just so that you know what the IT does. I would now like to call on stage uh, <laughs> Dr. Rishi Bhatnagar. Uh, Dr. Rishi Bhatnagar is the chair of the IT Future Tech panel. He's also uh, in his day job. So that's where he volunteers as the IIT Future Tech Panel. But in his day job, he's the president of ARIES. Uh, doctor, he's an international speaker, thought leader in the Internet of Things and Digital Space. He's co-authored a book called Enterprise IoT along with the team from Bosch. He's the recipient of the ET Now Business Leader of the Year, Voice and Data Leadership Recognition Award, as well as India ISV IoT CEO of the Year Award, plus BTVI's Business Leader of the Year. So lots of list of awards. Currently at the president of Aries Communications India, Dr. Bhatnagar is leading the Aries business in the Indian subcontinent, MEA and the APAC region. I should add, Rishi is also a dear friend. So, Rishi, please, it's over to you. Thank you, Shekhar. And uh, uh, thank you for everybody to join this such a session. Uh, you know, we are in a habit of calling, I'm calling somebody on stage. So, <laughs> now the stage is at home and we all are here. So th welcome and thank you. Uh, in 2015, we started India IET IoT panel with around eight people as volunteers. And the vision at that time was how can we evangelize and let India know that this revolution is coming. While working on different white papers, we created different working groups. We called a lot of volunteers to come. In 2016, we started our first IoT Congress. And I still remember Mustafa sir is there in the call and how he told me and teach, taught me how a conference can be organized. With starting with that, and it was very encouraging that Ravi Shankar Prasadji at that time, who was the communication and IT minister, gave us a video message. The Secretary Government of India came and so on and so forth. That in the fourth edition in 2019, we had the message from the Honorable Prime Minister. And I had an opportunity to meet Suresh ji himself in his office. He was kind enough to give us his video message for our startup awards. Thank you very much, sir, for your encouragement. In 2018, we realized that uh, the vision of evangelizing IoT is over. People know about what is the Internet of Things. Now, the thought is to see how can we vision to make India leader in IoT. With that kind of vision, we started working. We created different working groups and then... Last year, while working on different works and different white papers, we have been able to see that we should will work on 11 different working groups and we should not be thinking only about Internet of Things, but to see how future technologies, including AI, machine, language, machine learning, AR, VR, blockchain, everything we can include so that we can provide a consolidated solution to the industry. Our thought leader awards, our startup awards, have been really encouraging and people have been participating quite a lot in all of that. It has been a real uh, success that we have been able to get these kind of organizations, many of the organizations in India participate. Now it's a, it has a global uh, uh, advisory board with people all over the world trying to see what are we doing, what kind of white papers we are generating and how can they learn from it. Without taking much time, you know, I am really want to say I am really very thankful and really feeling proud. Two of my advisory board members, Vijay sir and Indra ma'am, are there today to speak and guide us. And Mustafa sir, who has always been a guide to me as a person and to IIT, is also there. And Suresh sir, thank you very much for joining us. We are really keen to hear from you with your vast experience and knowledge. How can we get India back on track and how the future technology can work on it. Thank you. Thank you, Rishi. Thank you so much. Uh, without wasting any more time, I would like to invite Sri Suresh Prabhuji uh, to speak. Just, I mean, he does not need any introductions. We all know him. But just a few lines because we have an international audience as well. Uh, Sri Suresh Prabhuji is India Sherpa at G20 and G7. Uh, uh, he he's represents India there. He is a six times member of the parliament. He was formerly the Minister of Commerce and Industry and Civil Aviation in the previous government. 
And at various points of time, he has been part of the ministries, whether it was industry, environment, fertilizers, chemicals, power, heavy industries, and public enterprises. Currently, he is a member of the Rajya Sabha. And he has been in the been a member of the Lok Sabha in the 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th uh, Lok Sabha sessions. He's a chartered accountant by profession and a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants India. That's a very, very small uh, introduction to the body of work that you have done, sir. But we are very, very excited to listen to what you have to say and very thankful that you could spare your time to come here today. Thank you so much, sir. So thank you very much, Mr. Sanyal and Mr. Bhatnagar for uh, providing the backdrop to this program. Thank you, my dear friend Indra, for introducing me to all of you and bringing me into this very interesting platform. I know Vijay Kari is also one of the members of the advisory board and I'm sure his advice is benefiting a lot. So I really thank you for all for bringing me into this very interesting group of professionals who are really pioneering, doing a pioneering work in various fields of life. Uh, you just mentioned the topic of this program, how to bring India back on track. Of course, this is a cliche which we always use for focusing something which we have probably lost focus of. Therefore, we say we, we want to bring it back on track. Normally, as former railway minister, I know everything has to move on track all the time. And we really therefore uh, have to wonder whether we should use your combined knowledge, use technologies, known technologies today, the emerging technologies and the future technologies which are still to come into the commercial domain. All of those together, how do you use them to bring high growth rate of growth for the country. But something interesting is that though we now talk about the fourth industrial revolution, we always use technology. I am not talking now we means India alone. There is humanity in the world for all times to come. What has changed is the nature and the shape of those technologies. It is not that there was no technology in existence even say 10,000 years ago. Even 75,000 years ago, when the real using this very famous book now, Homo sapiens terminology, when the, those sapiens started walking on the planet, they also used technology. But how did, how could they move from one place to another? From Africa to far away to Australia and from this side into large North America. How was it possible? So technology was known to them. They knew, and in fact, the biggest discovery of technology at that time, which changed probably the shape of things to come, was fire. One of the biggest discoveries. But just technology has always been guiding the development of humanity. What is now changing dramatically is the magnitude of its change that is bringing in the speed at which it is coming into force and the amount of obsolescence it is causing to the known technologies. At the rate at which the obsolescence is happening is phenomenal. And therefore, the challenge for India would be how do you make keep track of these changes? How to integrate those changes into our day to day life, into in day to day life things, not just the household lives, but country as a whole, in the entire economic mainstream, how do you bring them in? It's one matter. But first and foremost thing would be, how do you keep track of something which is becoming obsolete and something which is on the realm of change, which is going to come in maybe after a few years. If you know that, itself will be a great help for India's policy planners. And who can do that better than an institute like yours? Because, firstly, you are a multidisciplinary skills you possess, you are that way independent, but also all professionals, you are direct link with the industry which is so important because technology per se, if it is not an applied technology, then again it has some limitation because it can just remain 
in some laboratory or in some academic institution. So, we have a perfect understanding of all that. So, first and foremost, in my opinion, an institution like yours should become a think tank for technology and therefore try to guide the country as a whole as to what is coming and what is going out. That is very equally important, what is becoming obsolete. So, that is also equally important. So, even the guidance provided on these lines will be of great help to the country as a whole. Now, secondly, we had no choice but to embrace all technology that are going to come. Why I'm saying there is no choice because I was just talking someday a few months ago, I think in uh, probably I don't remember the forum but somewhere outside the country to a large audience and I was telling them, is it possible for any country in the world to prevent a technology from coming into their territory and geography? Can you, and I gave an example, can you stop air from coming in? Is there any way that you can stop air from coming in? Air will always come in. In a room, you can purify the air. You cannot prevent air from coming in. So, technologies of today are become that intrusive. They don't need a facilitation to enter. Because technology is a platform, but there are multiple platforms on which you can adopt the technology, can access the technology without necessarily permission being given by somebody. Of course, some proprietary technologies you cannot access just like that unless you take care of the IPS. But technology per se, so presuming that IPS have been taken care of, you cannot prevent a technology from coming in. So, in a way, you can say that there is no technology in the world which can prevent another technology from coming into your country. So, there is no preventive technology. Like, for example, when people are developing very high-ended weapons which can actually descend on your country and destroy everything, the country is prepared a preventive missile that will actually make sure that once you fire a missile from my country and you are targeting in my country, then my country will fire it in such a way that it will get destroyed somewhere outside itself. But I don't see there is any technology that's a military capability and only instrument related issue that I can prevent your instrument from getting destroyed. But technologies that Professor Bhatnagar just, Dr. Bhatnagar just mentioned, earlier Mr. Sanyal talked about it, are not the kind of technology that can prevent. And therefore, embracing them is the best option. Rather than wasting our energy into how do I prevent it? Rather than that, my strategy should be how do I embrace it? How do I integrate it with best possible outcomes for myself as a country? And therefore, if you change this mindset and decide to adapt yourself to the new technological changes, and therefore, the, then the question that comes, if you accept this, and this is, in my opinion, the only way we can progress in future, and if you accept that part, then comes another help that you can offer, is what is the best platform, what is the best ecosystem that we should create to adopt these technologies into different kinds of socio-economic activity. So, rather than prevention, now come to a different stage, adaptability. And there again, I can clearly see a role for an organization like yours. Because who will prepare, talk about the ecosystem? I can individually, I am going to be the user of technology. So, maybe Indra or Vijay can go and talk to the technology holders, pay their license fee and bring the technology here. But they cannot create the entire ecosystem. They are in industry. But we need a proper ecosystem to adopt several aspects of it. So, again, that I can clearly see 
a role for you. I'm just thinking, maybe I don't prepare so <laughs> I'm giving my off the cuff remarks and give the ideas just, just to kickstart this discussion. The third element in my opinion, and which I think is going to be extremely important because as Dr. Bhatnagar earlier mentioned that why not just be a participant into IoT? Why not be the leader of it? In fact, this is one opportunity in which the race is equal. All of us are at ground zero and therefore we can we are starting really on the same platform as a world. Whoever takes that early lead can actually succeed. Not just early lead, but a proper lead. The early starter, there is no early more advantage because we don't hold it anyway. It's only applied by that we are doing it today. Can we use and look at some sectors in which there are certain challenges? And therefore, can we use some kind of, if not a total integration, some sort of applied integration of these different technological backgrounds to come up with a solution for a particular aspect of it? One can say our agriculture is so much driven by individuals. As a result of that, we have so much of disguised employment, we can say. There so many people could be taken off the farm, but where will they go? That's another issue that I'm not discussing that today. There are some ideas and I'm working on those ideas. I'm not want to discuss that. But let us come to agriculture per se. What are the challenges of agriculture? One, and the primary problem is of water. Now, what is the problem of water in agriculture? 86% of the water of India, which is only 4% of the total water of the world, in any case, the India has, that's uh, fresh water resources, goes into agriculture, 86%. So, can you therefore make, bring all these technologies together, including artificial intelligence and Internet of Things, to make sure that water is given in a manner that what that crop needs, the time it needs, the bare quantity it needs, if you can actually come up with a solution integrating this technology, just imagine the transformative effect it can have, not just on India, or not, on, not just on agriculture, but on everything else. Why? Because Indra would be doing a business industry, and she is always told that industry is misusing the water. The fact is that 86% of water is used for agriculture. So industry can use it when it is available. The household can use it when it is there in the tap. So if you don't release the water, that 86%, then the rest of the economic activity, rest of the social activity can get that water. And to release it, you cannot make water. I am sure one day your IT will think about making water also. I am sure you will have the capability. But at least today, we can technically make water, we can do it in laboratories, but the kind of quantity of water we need, we, we cannot have it. We can desalinate it, but we can recycle it, but we cannot manufacture it. So, only way we can actually make it available for other uses than agriculture is by making water used for agriculture in a manner which is optimized and also done in a proper manner. But there is other element. The water, too much water is not good for the soil. In fact, salinity can increase and can cause more damage to the soil. And the soil only guarantees the fertility, which in turn can produce agricultural products from this land. Land doesn't produce it, it's a topsoil. So now, can we use these new technologies? For example, Internet of Things, you can always know everything. You can have a sequence of events which ensures that it can happen in a proper manner. So, you know exactly the kind of, in fact, the first green revolution happened because the research available in the laboratories and the new crop varieties that were discovered could be used in farm in a shortest possible time with an assistance provided by the agriculture extension workers. So, today just imagine, all that was done manually. We need man anyway, 
because even artificial intelligence presupposes that the intelligence which is put from somewhere else into the artificial intelligence. So the basic human intelligence is always needed. The human intelligence is responsible for artificial intelligence anyway. So why not we think about making a sector like this completely transformed through use of such technologies? Well, it's about deep irrigation, which helped Israel. Can we think about now completely leapfrogging into a completely different level and making it happen? And why I'm telling you this? Today, agriculture is about 14% of the India's GDP, with more than half of the population dependent on it. The moment you bring transformation in agriculture, I just mentioned the water and its linkage, but I'm not going into other aspects because I think this program is not on agriculture. But this will have a huge positive impact on all other segments of India's economy, in services, in industry. In any case, technology application itself is a service sector activity. Whereas, once you start using it, and once you start getting into a different mode of agriculture, there will be more industrial applications will be needed that will have another spin up benefit on industry itself. So, this can actually transform, can increase agriculture income. The moment that happens, you will see that 14% of GDP, which comes from agriculture, can actually have a huge impact. The other aspect is, and that is something which probably is a need and that's not something I know you are not into the fundamental research but we are actually using those technologies and applied part of it but even then what an important thing India is going to need and because I think both Indra and Vijay both are from that segment so let me mention briefly but I wanted to say something else but I just saw her face and just stuck me is you mentioned about mobility I think you just, that's you mentioned right mobility so I think mobility is important. But what drives the mobility? You cannot have mobility unless you use some energy. So what kind of energy you like to use for mobility? Liquid fuel, okay. That is what is today driving most of the mobility in the world. But can you think about the renewables integration into the mobility part? And that would also depend upon storage. So I think that area of energy storage is going to be extremely critical, extremely important, but I'm not, I was not going to say that this is something which is well known and talked a lot about, but I'm going to the other part. And that is, again, I'm saying it's not fundamental research you are doing. That's the job of some of the fundamental research institutions, but still, the big challenge we are going to face as a country is materials. When you don't have a own air earth sources and you want to build, Tomorrow's very vibrant economy, how can you do that without having proper access to this material that are going to be made out of this? Today, we have talked about for many years energy security is a big challenge because we import so much of oil, etc. But which I just mentioned about energy storage can actually change the dimension of the energy security aspect. There can be do not import, we can solve it. But what about the security of society, economy, and all, all the activities which are dependent on some materials like rare earths which are not available, how do you manage it? How do you survive? And therefore, this is going to be are the key challenge for us. As I said, I will just talk about two or three things, so I don't want to go into something else. But let me come back to back on track on what the issue that you are talking about. What is the back on track issue? That how do you develop India? And this is very interesting challenge we got. Because it is also part of a philosophy. Not just India, but more or less all the human beings in the world, they derive the knowledge from the same source. So maybe the philosopher's name differs. But a source of philosophy remains the same because philosophy finally depends on ultimate truth. And ultimate truth cannot change. So what is that ultimate truth? People all realize that if you want to do something different and you want to first find out whether what you are, the way you are going out, the way you are traveling is not right, the first thing you need to do is to pause. 
go into a space. I think this was really nearly thanks to COVID. And in, thanks to Corona, we got this great opportunity of forced stop and therefore the time to introspect. It's a great opportunity for us to really revisit about our own study. We are all the time thinking about building something by looking at others. Can we not look at our own self? Find out our own strengths and build on that for global applications. See, this is again part of our own Indian philosophy as well. So today, very interestingly, and this, I don't know whether uh, your institution seems to be very powerful, because I think to set a proper background for this program, the cabinet yesterday decided to do something interesting. That space is something which we have decided now to open up. Space is always open, but space programs were not always as open as they should have been. ISRO has done a phenomenal job. I will tell, tell you an interesting story. The present, the, the senior most advisor who sits in the blue house of the president of South Korea, a very, very dear friend of mine, when I was just went to South Korea a few weeks ago, just before the COVID started, and we had a very interesting meeting in the blue house of the president's house, and he was telling me, asking me a question, which we had discussed earlier, because he was also my friend for a long time, so we had discussed earlier. The issue was, how can we use India's low-cost space applications which are very high-ended for making into a globally accepted product. Now, this is something very interesting. When we started a space program, we had never heard of the bottom of pyramid story. That came much later. C.K. Prasad talked about bottom of pyramid much, much later. When we started this program many years ago. And why we had to work on the program and we had to modify the program Again, because of the force situation. If you recall, there was a time, of course, now I'm not talking about space, I'm talking about something else, but there was a time when India was denied access to the supercomputer. Then we discovered it, we had it on our own. Space program was in a similar trajectory. That we didn't have access to some of the high-end technology. So we had to develop it our own. Today, Today's topic of your program, back to track, how can India grow in future? Can we therefore focus on some of such technologies, like the space technology, which we develop on our own almost? But everything basic we discovered. It was from somewhere, but the application part we did it ourselves. So, what Professor Dr. Bhatna mentioned earlier. Can we become India's India could be the leader of some some of these things? Always possible. But we should not try to think that we want to be a leader. See, that's a wrong connotation actually. Leadership should not be claimed to be ours. The world should say we are the leader. So we should not say that I am already a leader. And when I look back, there is no one follower for me. So rather than that, let me not say whether I am a leader. Say that I want to move in this direction for a global scale operation. That's why I said India has always been integrated. Space is another good example, but can we now therefore think about more such sectors? Knowing about your institution, I'm quite excited by the fact that you have such a structure in which membership driven, but with such top class people coming in and thinking about your ideas. I remember, I don't about your institution, of course, but I would therefore like to challenge you to think what could be these new frontiers. Which is something which not only for our own self, but something which will have an application globally. And particularly, we always look at applications when we say H1BC visa in USA. Can we think about applications in Africa? Same number of people like India? Same level of development, so they will be happy to get it. Rather than somebody who is going to and you go to US and say, I have a technology. They will first start from a high pedestal thinking, what are you talking about? We know better, we are the best in the world. Other, unlike that, when you go to our friends there, so close to us, closer to us, if not very close to us, 
they will be more receptive to look at look at these ideas i think india future has to be technology driven as it always has been as i told you the change of technology the nature of technology has changed the technology has always been driving it but the kind of change that we are going to see in the next few years time will be just phenomenal so we should not just watch it but we should drive it and to drive it yeah. we need strategy strategy cannot be made by someone like me who doesn't know much but by you who understand everything so well so let me offer you my best wishes and also we enforce my commitment towards making this happen with you as friends and partners thank you very much thank you very very much it's really i mean all the ideas that you touched about has got real deep impact for india and uh, as an institution we will continue to look at your support as well as work towards these areas uh, thank you so much for your insight and now we have got about 10 more minutes of your time I'd like to open this up for any questions that people might have uh, around what you spoke uh, please keep your questions to the area that you spoke about and the topic of today um, you can use the question box which is there right next to your screen to put in the questions and we can take few of them we have got about 10 minutes of search time in the meanwhile while we are getting the questions to the panel is there something that you would like to comment or question while we are waiting for the questions to come in so shekhar let me start um, sir uh, as i told you that we are working on 11 working groups and honestly this year we started a working group only on water and last year we started a working group on agriculture and started working on how we can utilize technology to help our farmers and agriculture sector and this year the major focus is on water and similarly on energy so you know we have been working with different teams and trying to see how can we work on these areas but sir i am really very thankful to you for your guidance you know your thought on uh, uh, you know the super computer was not given to us and so was the space technology and how can we work ourselves to become uh, uh, you know take ourselves to a higher level i'll definitely work with our panel members and see how can we take it forward thank you very much sir thank you vijay ji you have you have a point yes sir you have been well associated with the central government and uh, you know the problems facing the country more than any of us here one of the issues is that energy segment or the electricity segment is both center as well as state subjects so is agriculture uh, so are a lot of subjects where there is no unified thought process uh, similarly specifications etc my suggestion to you sir is why don't you drive such a centralized think tank which can set specifications across the entire country where we can have uniform policy across the country because like we've got a centralized gst panel why not have centralized think tanks your thoughts on this sir no actually see there is always a challenge between people with a trade off in life so there are centralization there is always an advocacy for centralization always but there are trade offs the advantage of centralization as you correctly mentioned you can see something and get it through but then the question is where is the democracy and now therefore the trade off is how to make both things happen at the same time now i tell you something and i didn't know dr bhatnagar as a rishi he is trying to work on water and agriculture which is my interest but i, I am saying uh, why i was saying i uh, why mentioning this today we have this challenge so how do you push through everything which is such a good idea but because of various levels of government you cannot implement it i would say the solution lies in technology coming to the issue of think tank actually we have a think tank it's called a national think tank the name of the think tank is niti aayog 
But the TID National Institute must work on these issues. But I personally feel, I mentioned it, an ecosystem that is necessary for a technology to be properly delivered. So there, I agree with you. Some part of, of in time it can create that application part of it in terms of absorption of technology. What type of ecosystem is needed to make it happen? Okay. So that's fine. But I think it's a great opportunity for us is to use some of these critical areas where we can show some Samatkan, the miracle, in terms of producing more, automatically everything will fall in place. And that Samatkar can come to technology alone. There's nothing more than that. Right, so there is one question which has come from Kunal Kathuria, who is the Senior Associate Futures First Info. He's saying, sir, you mentioned about Korea, who are one of the world readers as far as uh, tech is concerned. So can we learn something from them as to how they are able to retain the best talent in their country and not lose it to the Western countries? South, you know, it's a, actually, it's again a miracle country, has produced some exceptional results in such a short period of time. And what is a miracle come from? Only two things actually speaking, again, oversimplifying it. Technology and scaling it up. The scaled up, everything can be applied to the global markets. And if it's actually the, exactly the thing that we should try to do is use our own ideas and not necessarily everything can be homegrown it is not uh, homegrown in a sense with technologies. So some technology has to come out. Like for example nobody can claim that India is the author of blockchain or artificial intelligence or interpreter thing. this is something which will come but we can, can we use it together and use it for some time. For that as my South Korean friend was asking me there could be a partners in doing that. And therefore, we should try to believe and work on alliances, partnerships, which can actually benefit them, benefit us, benefit the rest of the world. So I think this is what we should try to do. I think, Indra, you wanted to ask something? See, I, I could see your hand being raised. Ma'am, you are mute. Can I? Can I go ahead and say so? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So, uh, I personally feel that now we waste a lot of resources, be it water, be it power. And government is one of the biggest waster of resources. How can we make government accountable and how is it that uh, we can use technology? Uh, Rishi, I think this is an area where we can all work together to ensure that the government of India doesn't waste uh, a lot of our resources. You know, I think. Uh Basically, as we always believe in that so traditional wisdom, is that necessity is the mother of invention. So today, I think whole government machinery, whether it's central government, state government, local government, they all have to produce results with less resources available because the economic activity and the tax to GDP ratio, India's tax to GDP ratio is growing. But now, if the economy is not Going to that extent, the resources of the government will be limited. So, therefore, in that context, government will be looking at ideas. And therefore, I think it's the best time for industry to interface with the government and actually come up with a solution. The best solution is, as I'll again tell you, try to work in a manner that your solutions can be applied without too much of government support. Government should be a facilitator. Or government should not create a problem for you, I can understand. But if you can actually work in that particular way, it would be a fantastic thing. You know, actually, many examples, and you are in Bangalore, you know, or IT industry itself is a good example of that. And this could just keep growing without any problem. So I think even the other example is, because I was also responsible for it, I was chemicals and fertilizer minister, is a pharmaceutical industry. I was minister 22 years ago, when I was telling pharma industry, that your products can be sold globally, and particularly in the Latin America. And everybody was laughing at me. But because I forced them, they went there, and now they are doing very good business in Latin America. Some of them have factories there. So I will actually force them to do. So in fact, the role of the government should be like that only. Explore market for them. Open opportunities for them. Ensure that doors are open for them wherever they get stuck. And then you can use your own powers of technology, manager ability to do this. I think, and time has come for this, because as I said, government will want to have better results in shortest possible time, 
with least of government involvement because that's what government's ability also will be limited because now to look at it today the entire government machinery is focused on fighting corona the police are involved not only in india i am talking about globally in fact all over the world and in fact in some country like in south africa the army is on the street to fight corona so the entire government must which including army which is supposed to protect the borders from external threat are being used to fight one thing so in that context what is the best way is to create another arm of the government to create such opportunities or the government will be always be inclined to think that is the best way to do is to let industry come out with solution and we can produce it so it's the best time for you i hope we all seize it together so i if you permit me i had to go for some other program so it was 245 i had to go for other program but if you permit otherwise there is some one or two question i can definitely answer so thank you so much thank you so much for uh, all your insight and we definitely vijay ji you want to say something yes please yes sir sir uh, two suggestions one is i entirely agree with your optimism for india and i i also believe that if we go further properly we can become a world superpower but sir two things one is that we are seeing here that though our country is having the lowest uh, internet costs in the world our internet is not world class so my two suggestions or three suggestions would be that why can we not focus on just three aspects number one our internet needs to be the lowest cost and the best in the world number two our electricity needs to be stable and it needs to be the cleanest electricity in the world number three our engineering needs to be the best and with the latest technologies and if government focuses on these three areas uh, under your guidance and leadership because you've changed the electricity scenario in the country if we do focus on these three things we can be a world leader in a very short time i'm sure you will agree sir so what i would like from you is how we can move ahead in this no in fact i cannot agree with you more because that starts from a basic premise and what is that premise is that as you can see as i can see in my screen in front of me see each one of you have a huge capability and you can go and succeed anywhere in the world like imran's son has succeeded even in hollywood even in he is making films there directing films there so you can succeed anywhere in the world then what is that does not allow them to succeed back home as much as they can succeed elsewhere that exactly the precisely the point you are mentioning is coming from the fact that we should provide the basic structure infrastructure and that is what exactly you are talking about i fully agree and that cost of that infrastructure and i will add one or two more points is cost of doing business the ability of the businessman to do something better all of that will count a lot more i think i agree with you so how to do it i think that's what prime minister is now i think is completely focused on that issue i think we should hope that will happen sooner but i there cannot be any other alternative than this because india doesn't lack in entrepreneurship so only problem is that entrepreneurship should not be used to fight something which is so unnecessary like the government system the government procedure the bureaucracy and other so i think if you can avoid that and remove that road block i think that's something which will really yield the kind of result that all of us are expecting and ultimately if you really look at it the growth of a country can never happen without growth of society and society can never grow if the individual don't grow so what you are talking about is allowing the individuals inherent ability to grow and that is exactly is what the growth is all about so i think i fully agree with you right thank you so much sir uh, for all the insight and the, this discussion the questions which came your answers what it seems right now is whatever the it is do, doing is absolutely aligned with the thought process that you have just given us and we are we have been working in various of those areas already so we would continue to seek your guidance and support and we will come back to you with keep keep coming back to you with reports of what we have been doing and where we have been able to create impact and hopefully that should help propel our country to a greater height so thank you very much i take your leave thank you so much but i don't leave you
So I will be with you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So now we move to the next part of our conversation, which is a very high-powered discussion by four very high-powered individuals who are leading industry, who are industry leaders by themselves, who have been very successful in their own right, and talk to them about their thoughts about how do you get India Inc. back on track. I'd like to take this point. You've heard a uh, number of them, but I'd like to take this time to introduce them formally to all of you. Start uh, with Indra Man. Indra Manan, she is the chairman and managing director of Senapati Whiteley Group. Uh, she's coin of an illustrious and highly respected family with a long history in business and industrial activities for over seven decades. And with close connections with government and community in Bangalore, she took over the mantle of presidency of the chamber during its time. She's the chairman and managing director, as I said, of Senapati Whiteley Group, a flagship member of the Senapati Group of Companies in Bangalore. The company is a pioneer in India in the manufacturing of press ports and press papers for electrical insulation, filter paper, automotive and industrial applications. She is also the managing director of Lakshman and Isola Private Limited, which is uh, engaged in the manufacture of sophisticated insulation products for generators, motor tractors, etc. She is part of our India development panel of the IET, and she supports the growth of uh, uh, the growth of IET in India. She is also a member of our IoT uh, uh, panel as well. Next, I'd like to introduce Mr. Mustafa Wajid. Mr. Mustafa Wajid is the chair uh, of the steering committee of the IT Future of Mobility and Transport Focus. Aside from being the chair of IT's uh, Communities Committee for South Asia, uh, sorry, chair of the India Development Panel, that was his previous chairship, chairmanship, chair, chair of the India Development Panel, which is the visionary body which brings together uh, IIT forward. Mrs. Menon is also a member of the India Development Panel of the IIT. Uh, in his day job, uh, Mustafa Ji uh, works as the Managing Director and CEO of the Meher Group. Uh, he stumbled into entrepreneurial career in 1977 at the age of 16 when he designed and manufactured his first power capacitor in Bangalore. Uh, started his, uh, his, he keeps on saying that I did a startup when it was not fashionable to do startups. And he started a company called Meher Capacitors, uh, which has now grown into the Meher Group, uh, which he uh, now guides. And his thought processes about change and transformation is something that we look forward to. He uh, supports and mentors a variety of startups and has high transformation potential. He looks at those things and his ideas are very incisive. We would like to also introduce you to Mr. Vijay Karya, who is the chairman and managing director of Dravin Group. With experience of more than 30 years, Mr. Karya, Chairman and Managing Director of Ravin Group, has played a key role in identifying growth opportunities for the group within India and across the globe. He believes in harnessing newer technologies to provide smart electrical solutions and at the same time promoting clean and green energy and encouraging innovative ideas for improvement in electricity consumption. Awarded as one of Asia's most promising business leaders, recognized as the game changer of India in 2018 and top 50 entrepreneurs by the Economic Times. He's a visionary with vast knowledge and experience in the power and electricity sector. He was recently recognized as a leading industrialist at the House of Lords UK and was awarded as a patron, patron of the Global Awards by Priyadarshini Academy. He's a chartered accountant by profession and member of the chartered Account, Institute of Chartered Accountants India. And we are very, very excited to have this high power group, a panel here, to talk about what should be the next steps for India Incorporated as we go forward. So, uh, the, also, you have Dr. Rishi Bhatnagar in this. I have already introduced Rishi to that, so I'm not going back and introducing him again. We all know him. A lot of you already have worked with him in various capacities. So, this is our panel Mustafa sir, Indra ma'am, Vijay ji, and Rishi. Uh, I have got about three or four questions just to kickstart the conversation. Uh, which we will start off with. And then we will also wait for the audience to ask a lot of questions. We have got sufficient time for the audience to ask questions. So that is what we'll do. See, in my mind, when I look at the industry and how COVID-19 has impacted the industry, I feel different industries have been impacted in a different way. Uh, for example, the IT-ITS industry, uh, 
just picked up their laptops and went home and started working from home. And uh, so well, there was a bit of security challenges and internet challenges and stuff like that, but they were niggling challenges, not really. And most of the time, they had an uninterrupted way of going forward. Yes, they do tout this as the world's largest exper experiment of working from home in the IT industry, which nobody thought would be possible, but it has now become possible. But oh, out of the four of you here, three of you come from a manufacturing background. The way the manufacturing industry has been impacted by this COVID-19 is very different from the IT industry or the office-based industries. So. It is important to understand for our audience as to how this whole pandemic is impacting different kind of industries in different ways, how the problems are different from each other. So my first question would be to ask you as to how do you see the difference in the impact in your industry or the industries that you see around you and get your perspectives around that. So I'd like to start with Indrama, uh, if, if I may. Sure. <coughs> Okay, uh, thank you all for having me here. Uh, what I would really like to say is during any crisis, uh, COVID-19 has uh, given us all a big jolt. And I think uh, we need to, uh, sometimes the jolt is good because we, we need to assess the situation and uh, <clears throat> address it very, very seriously. In our industry, I would like to say that healthcare is uh, in all industry hub. Like uh, my industry is in a rural area. I think uh, the government and we should have taken care of. We uh, we started a hospital way back. Uh, I think uh, 55 years ago, my my father did, and we got the first uh, rotary hospital way back in 76 or 77. But that's not good enough. I think every industrial hub needs to have basic health care. So that's one of the most critical uh, requirements for industry in India. To make our people comfortable, to ensure that they are safe and their families are safe. Otherwise, how can you work and provide? So I think that's one critical area Taker uh, that we need to address. Then again, like Vijay said and uh, Prabhuji said, we need to take care of uh, our water resources, which is also extremely critical. We need to take uh, care of power. I I know we're talking about future of technology, but we, we really need to address our basic infrastructure in India. I think that is very important and I don't think uh, we've addressed it enough, in my opinion. All right. Thank you, Vam, for that. Uh, any additional comments from any of the other panelists on this? How you see your industry being impacted? Any or your ancillary industries? What are the challenges that you see immediately as of now? Uh, thank you, Shekhar. I think uh, if I am to be a little bit optimistic, I would say that uh, this this jolt that we got from the pandemic has actually perhaps enabled all of us to get on track because the pandemic has created a situation which none of us had ever seen. It has destroyed a lot of things. It has destroyed plans. It has destroyed workplaces. It has destroyed economies, but most of all, I think it has destroyed notions that we had. And the destroyed notions has made us realize that we don't require large and expensive workplaces to work. And that we can do a lot of things in a more economic and commercially viable manner. Uh, I think that's the big positive, I think, that this pandemic has uh, brought about. I'm not denying the fact that it's impacted the lower segment or the lower strata of society uh, to a very large extent. But at the same time, the positives are uh, very, uh, very much less polluted environment. Uh, 
the government and businesses have started working together for the first time that i can see in my life you know that government and businesses are aligned so all in all i think as as a first step i would say that the pandemic has created huge opportunities and i think uh, if business people act properly if they act in alliance with what is required of them if they shun their competitiveness and work collaboratively it's very very exciting times ahead for the industry yes it's slowed down manufacturing to a very large extent but that should pick up a lot of industries will get destroyed but i think a lot of them will get back on track very quickly uh mustafa sir anything to add to this from your side yeah just a moment yeah thank you for those uh, observations indra and uh, vijay very important to remember uh, what you said uh we are in a situation i being an electrical engineer i tend to use mathematics to give analogies and uh, make decisions of my own uh, the current situation is like a complex differential equation whose roots are not really clear and uh, there are many factors here for example health and safety is right at the top of the agenda technologies that can enable contactless working or can eliminate physical interaction etc are suddenly becoming important uh the ability of an economy to grow by being export driven has suddenly become very very debatable because everybody every country and there is trying to get more protectionist uh we are talking about self reliance so are other people and they are also going to do a lot of things to stop importing things that they are doing today and finally we have the i mean there are several issues but i'm only listing a few top ones and the continuous rise of china which has been something that has been happening over the last couple of years and the belligerence that we see uh, that is accompanying that rise uh coming back to india inc i would caution everybody that that if you look at it from a mathematical mathematical point of view what we have is a discontinuity now this is not like a car which has stopped which after some time will start and we can resume our journey okay we are going to have discontinuity and if those of us who have studied mathematics will remember that there are four different types of discontinuity some are finite some are infinite okay it depends on how we we model the equation so what is going to happen is that this is a situation which for india inc will create a scenario where post covid whenever that happens we will have to see a new avatar of india inc in which we may find lot of new people we may find that some of our friends and our close associates who were very big in industry or in india inc before the covid are not are no longer present this is going to be a very dislocating kind of thing and that is why i call it a discontinuity uh, i remember during my career the economic liberalization as a turning point of india's economic growth and i can remember several corporate companies and large business houses which were dominant before liberalization and who are nowhere on the picture today i think the same thing is going to happen post covid so what we need to remember is that this is a complicated subject we are not going to be exporting ourselves to grow because everybody who is an importer today has become much more careful okay we are going to be having to deal with this belligerence of china problem because we have a multi thousand kilometer border with them and last but not the least the big elephant in the room will be unemployment we can all talk about coming back on track but if we will never be able to come back on track unless we solve the unemployment problem in whatever form and manner that needs to be done so we are facing a very grave crisis we are facing a very grave complex situation that is why i likened it to a differential equation classically in mathematics when we have a very complicated differential equation we use a very interesting mathematical tool to solve it it's called a laplace transform it basically breaks up the differential equation into parts resolves them individually and then integrates the whole lot to come back with a solution i think this is what is required there are no sort of one stop one push button kind of solutions uh, while we go on crying about lack of infrastructure lack of alignment between the central government and the state governments these are points that came up i suspect that given our democracy and the vibrant democracy that we are 
these will continue we will have to work around them rather than and wait in anticipation for something to happen so we have to solve the unemployment problem we have to solve all these issues now we come to the part where what is the future tech that can be used in resolving the complex parts of this differential equation the digital technology is definitely an area where if we get going properly we will probably because of our large population usage and language flexibility we can not only solve a lot of problems in india but we can probably reaffirm a leadership position in the global community because nobody has the population that we have for example let me tell you that what i heard is that china is at the forefront of facial recognition technology why because they just photographed everybody they are not going to worry about privacy and so on and so forth i am not giving that as an example i am giving it as a reference to how large population and digital technology can create new streams of competence which can put india on top i think that's a very important issue i think similarly electric mobility india is a country of two wheelers and three wheelers if we can move electric mobility into this domain coupled with electric mobility in buses and metros the railway anyway works on electricity now i think we will be able to show a lot of the way like what mr prabhu mentioned for example africa could be a very large opportunity for electric mobility companies because they also need two wheelers and three wheelers mobility is as important a human need as now digital technology okay so there are going to be different pockets of opportunities that will come up my caution is that it is a differential equation there is not only economic issues and technology issue there are also geopolitical issues involved so i think we need to discern these things and remember what happened just as a reference before and after india's economic liberalization so i think we are heading for a new india inc avatar many of which we do not know who exist today many of which who exist today who unfortunately may not be around uh, in the future of india inc so these are the realities that we will have to face and it is up to each and every company to understand this and try and find a way around it and 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 probably implement something but please remember in some ways we only can be reactive because we cannot predict the corona we cannot predict a vaccine so in some ways we have to be reactive in some ways we have to be proactive drawing the balance between these two in a point of discontinuity is what makes a good mathematician applying the same thing in real life and finding that balance will make for a good business and a peace of mind it is very important at this point of time to remember the philosophy ancient philosophies that can stabilize our thinking because like the buddha has said you can see clearly only when your mind is calm so if india inc has to get back on track the horizontal requirement across the sector of india inc and society is to think calmly because only then we can see clearly over to you shekhar thank you thank you mr sir uh very very profound uh, i'm sure our uh, audience is got a new thought process around what you just said and i'm i'm sure we'll have a lot of questions around what you just put i'll now like to go to rishi to get his inputs i had a series of four questions planned but i don't think i'll have to ask any of them because we have covered most of those questions so just with we'll just leave rishi to have the last word and then i'll open it up for questions yeah i just want to remind everybody before you go rishi at least put your questions in the question uh, format or you can raise your hand if you want to ask a live question directly to the panel so shekhar i'd like to make two points first being from the it industry you know from the very first day of when we started we are into the future technologies and it that that are implemented we all work on laptop we all are our infrastructure is on cloud so we can work from anywhere so the kind of disruption that uh, the other industries faced because of covid 19 our industry was very well covered and we were uh, we could we did not face that level of problem except for some uh, ensuring the data privacy data protection and all those kind of things we were able to work from home the remote locations the uh, access to those collaboration tools the kind of communication required the contactless uh, uh, we are all doing it from a, you know our own offices in chicago san jose london japan india and multiple location in india so you are used to it but the question now is when we came in 2016 and we were going to each and every large manufacturing plants and trying to tell them that you can remotely manage your machine 
<laughs> you can switch on, switch off, remotely monitor, remotely, and you make it a digital uh, uh, factory. You will be able to control your, motion, your your complete factory from your mobile or from your port laptop. Nobody was interested in hearing us. Few of us, few of them said, okay, let's do a pilot. Many And these are the decisions which used to be taken at the board level. I have given presentation to many boards. Okay. And every board chairman used to say, okay, let's work on a return on investment. What is the ROI? By when will we be able to do it? Shekhar, we did about 100 pilots with the manufacturing company. I am really sorry to tell that only one pilot got implemented across uh, factories and many of them continued as a pilot and nothing that happened. But in the last three months, the number of calls I got to move those pilots from those uh, to implementation are many. So, you know, as uh, Mustafa sir said and uh, Vijay sir also mentioned, you know, the technology needs to get implemented and if one of the factory could have been managed through remote locations and your mobile could have told you how much the production, how much the raw material, how much things can happen. So many of those industry 4.0 kind of thing that were there could have been implemented uh, are now getting, you know, a lot of requirements and people are asking for them to be implemented. Last word before I uh, give it back to you. There are a lot of thoughts that the old legacy machines there will be huge requirement to replace them to get them digitalized. Okay. Technology has been able to enable to create a platform by which I have a small hardware by which I can get some data from old 70 year old machine. Okay. So that paper industry, the cement industry, which are there from hundreds of years. And the people say, I already have a factory. Why will I implement in a new machine? You will not require to implement and buy a new machine. I can use your existing infrastructure and make it to an extent. Don't expect everything can be done, but to some extent, I can get some data out of it and start controlling it and provide you remote access to your infrastructure which is already existing and running. Thanks, Shekhar. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Rishi. Uh, it is a new world, isn't it? Uh, from all, all areas. And the people, as Mustafa said, as people get into, uh, adapt, the people who adapt to the new world faster will be the people who will uh, continue to grow and prosper in this new world. Now, I have got a question directly for uh, Mustafa sir. It says, uh, Abhi Sab Sabawala, consultant BCCI, has posted. He's asked, Mr. Vajid, what solutions do you suggest for reducing unemployment while embracing technology? I think uh, if you are looking at uh, India Inc, we include agriculture into India Inc. Now that the government has passed an ordinance that the produce can be sold anywhere else, I think that we you know how the unemployment problem uh, with a greater sense of vigor and enthusiasm in the rural part of our country, which is where the majority of our population lives, and that has further increased now because a lot of people have gone back from the cities. So it is up to the agricultural sector and companies that play in the agricultural sector to see how they can contribute towards improving prospects and increasing the money in the hands of the farmer. This will help the consumption economy. Let's remember India is heading towards being a consumption economy. We cannot export ourselves to prosperity like China did in a post-COVID scenario. So we will have to concentrate on improving consumption. And that starts with the agricultural sector. It needs to be adequately balanced and supported by uh, the traditional version of India Inc., which meant industry. And that will have to happen using a combination of technologies, some of which Rishi has described very clearly. Uh, because I think contactless, virtual, and also the ability to stay safe and healthy will determine how well the manufacturing sector operates. One small incident can lead to a shutdown of a complete factory. So we will have to go more and more contactless. So the grim reality is that most of the manufacturing industry is probably now trying to see how to optimize employment or to reduce it, to use a harsh word. This is the reality of the situation. So we will have to balance off this with the uh, corona reality as it unfolds. Uh, of course, this is a dynamic variable. Nobody can make predictions. So I would caution that, put a caveat, that if a vaccine comes tomorrow morning, things can be very different. That's the dynamism of the whole thing. The other thing in the digital side, 
uh, work from home i think is going to become a very important part of the, uh, everybody's lives in everybody's house uh, this is a problem that is going to be addressed has to be addressed very differently because typically in indian households we have at least two or sometimes three generations of people living grandparents parents and children so if we are going to have more and more of this work from home we need some new paradigms of standard operating procedures and so on and so forth the great advantage about work from home is that it actually opens up the possibility of increasing employment for delivering services on a global basis uh, this is a very very important part new thoughts are to be put into this because the reality is that the rest of the world does not have as many qualified engineers and technical people with skills that we have in sheer number now how do we ensure that these skills and competencies can be useful to people in other societies that is something that we should be looking at and probably that is the way to export ourselves into a little more prosperous situation as a country in the future so these are some of the ideas that are floating around uh, as i said please remember the principles of discontinuity i would strongly recommend to those of us who are engineers and uh, to go back to the discontinuity chapter in advanced mathematics and reread it because there is a lot of relearning that can happen from that i that's a rather long answer to a short question i hope it answered some of them at least thank you i'm sure it did i'm sure it did any any of uh, you would like to add on to what mustafa has said especially around unemployability and how do how do you see that being tackled in the future so uh, shekhar uh, while i agree entirely with uh, mustafa i think uh, we have to understand that uh, two three things are happening simultaneously the focus is now coming on to the uh, msmes and uh, just yesterday we had a, a very long uh, webinar with uh, sanjeev sanyal the principal economic advisor to the finance ministry and he also said that the government is focusing on msmes so the concern is moving towards smaller businesses uh, that's one part so you know the employment generation in the msme segment is much much more and uh, people are becoming more entrepreneurial in uh, this time of lockdown people have also started introspecting as to how we can do i'll give a very small example of near my house uh, suddenly at one place uh, a huge uh, on the road side a huge uh, vegetable shop opened up and uh, it's about 10 minutes walk from my house so we generally go for a walk up that slope and when i question because they seem to be set of young uh, boys they were actually boys who were uh, engineers and who were uh, financial experts and they decided to open up this vegetable shop and uh, they were going and getting these vegetables and they said that what to sit at home and do so we came and we said let's do this as a matter of social service they started with social service it uh, got down to business for them now though most of them have gone back to work in a limited situation they are continuing with that shop because they find that it's become an additional source of income for them and what they have done is they've got in other people so they financed a set of people suddenly we people who are always going and buying from malls are now shunned malls because we don't want to go there and suddenly our small kirana shops and our vegetable vendors who uh, were with us for years suddenly have turned back into focus so uh, similarly i think even in case of industry we are seeing that a lot of workers have run away but uh, we are yet slowly ramping up with lower manpower also to virtually the same levels as earlier if not fully at least we are 70% 80% there so it's mm-hmm. about more from less and i think this is going to create a lot of uh, opportunities while i don't deny that it's it's a very uncertain situation and uh, Uh, we don't uh, know what will happen but i think of the lot across the entire world india because of its adaptability and its jugar and its technology and ability to work with the barest of bare resources is going to land up at the top of the heap no great lovely uh, what i get out of this conversation before i move on to indra ma'am and prishi is that we have to start thinking differently the the structures that we were used to before especially around employability are changing 
So it is not necessary the way you were employed before and the way your thought of employability was in the pre-COVID world will remain the same. So your whole paradigm has to change and then opportunities are always there. So moving on to Indra ma'am and then to Rishi. Yeah, I feel, uh, you know, I, we, we need to change. I think large heartedness is a, a pre a prerequisite for any inter smooth implementation. So I think like uh, everybody said, we have to take care of the community around us immediately. Uh, it's a <clears throat> totally informed knowledge which are the industries that used uh, the large number of migrant people. I wish they and the particular industries and the government had worked together to provide housing for these people which uh, they've all used from all different parts of the country. So we should have ensured that they were uh, well taken care of. So there was no this large exodus. So people also have to start thinking differently about the people they employ and uh, their responsibility toward them and their well-being and for them and their families. I think that's a very important... Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with you, ma'am. Uh, moving on to Rishi, your thoughts around what the situation is unfolding on. So, Shekhar, uh, the question was more on the skill side. So, I just want to answer first on that. Okay. You know, uh, whenever anything new, any disruption or transformation happens, things will change. So, when the factories come in UK and people were still ruining the charkha, there is a job loss. Okay. And similar was the case when uh, the computerization was starting in India. And people said if the railways will get computerized, there will be huge amount of job loss. And there were street uh, strikes and people were on the street not to allow computerization in railways. Okay. But the IT industry flourished. India became an IT hub. And today we have a 260 billion US dollar worth of revenue or industry that came out of that transformation. The idea which I want to tell you, you know, every disruption or transformation, whatever I call it, will result in some level of change. We need to see how will we unskill ourselves and reskill ourselves to adapt to that change. So there will be some level of disruption, but there will be a huge amount of new kind of jobs that will emerge, is what my belief is. And uh, if you give me one more minute, I can give you an example where the electric rickshaw that moves from Meerut to the 25 kilometer villages and carry vegetables from villages back to Meerut, sell those vegetables in the evening and mm -hmm. carry stuff for the villagers which they have hours in the morning and become an Amazon for the uh, uh, rural area. So this was the, you know, serving the answered, becoming a new kind of, you know, the electric rickshaw and we were able to put some technology on top of it and we are doing a lot of things other than uh, just carrying vegetables and some urea and some fertilizers so that it is whatever new kind of job a new guy getting an e-rickshaw a guy getting you know more revenue because of transferring the fresh products from the villages to the city and carrying the stuff which the villager has asked from city back to the village it is a new job that got created okay who had thought of the electric rickshaw which can travel only 100 kilometers, can provide a new kind of job for that person who can earn by providing this. And we are adding lots and lots of other services on top of that e-rickshaw and seeing how can we provide service the unserved in villages and provide new kind of skills and new kind of jobs. So I am very uh, optimistic for uh, you know, the future. There can be a bit of uh, you know challenges, but we'll overcome. Yes, sir. Sure. Yeah. yeah, I just request everyone to remember that if you look at societies and GDP within societies, the largest contributor to uh, GDP within any society is anything and everything to do with mobility. This is true whether it is a Western country like America or India or China or any even a I would say a sub-Saharan African country. Uh, the need for people to move uh, is something that drives economic activity and actually can push economies into a high growth zone. So, I think that mobility solutions in India will particularly play an important role in getting the thing. Currently, today, as we speak, mobility accounts for close to 14-15% of India's GDP. It's almost the same 
Uh, in fact, uh, among the economic sectors, it is the largest. Uh, IT is big, but it is still smaller than the mobility. And the electrical industry, for example, is big, but smaller than automobile and so on and so forth. So, so I think that a lot of new jobs can get created around the mobility space. If we combine the agri-tech, agro, rural, urban scenario, uh, I see a whole lot of potential there. A good example was given by Rishi. So, and we have a very big advantage in India. We can actually emerge as the leader for light, light electric mobility in the world. Uh, a very large percentage of global population would actually be well served by that. I think that those are areas that uh, the Indian industry can work on and grow very fast and very rapidly, uh, even in a corona afflicted situation, which is causing a greater need for those kind of services to come up. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, sir. Uh, we are actually overrunning on time, but I cannot let go without asking each one of you one question, which I'm sure everybody would be interested in, is how are you tackling this challenge in your own industry or your, your company? And what steps are you taking to manage it as we as you go on? I'm sure a lot of people would like to understand and learn from it. So I'll start with Indra Ma'am once again. Uh, what what are the things that you are doing in your organization? Uh, you know, take care of this challenge that has come along. Okay. Uh, Shekha, I just want to say that uh, our group of industries is set up in a rural uh, setting. Uh, we come at the essential. So we were asked to open our company on the 6th of April. But the panchayat came to me, some panchayat members came to me and said, ma'am, uh, you know, if you open up, we will have people moving in from the city. And that will kind of hurt us. So I immediately said, look, I don't want the company to run at, uh, if you guys are not comfortable. So I shut down the operations and started it one month later. But I started think, uh, thinking, uh, like my dad, that I'm just taking care of my people and going one step at a time instead of just wanting to increase production Manifold, I just started uh, working with my people and to totally did not uh, cut any, uh, having to had the operations, I'm, I'm sorry, didn't um, get the, the order position ready, but totally provided salaries for everyone and all concerned and did not uh, reduce any salaries, but at the same time working very in, with a human interface with them taking care of all their problems. That's what I started. As a matter of fact, I just wanted to tell you, uh, it was a pity. I had the, the government had approached me and I had 300 people ready and waiting to supply, to pack food for uh, more than uh, two weeks, cleared up my canteen and my shop floor. But unfortunately, due, uh, due to logistical constraints, the government couldn't provide me the 10,000 tons they wanted me to pack. So... I'm just taking one day at a time and working with uh, our team. No, thank you, ma'am. And uh, the focus on humans and humanity is more important than ever at this point of time. And that's a lesson for everybody who is listening that whatever you do while you're working on business, the fact is that the focus on humans and humanity and our fellow human beings has to be there at all points of time. Uh, so as a lot of people say, the true metal of a leadership comes when, when how you perform in a crisis. And we can see two, between the two of you that you are stru truly stepping up. I will move on to uh, Mustafa sir now and understand from him what he has been doing, how he's, he's been handling his business and what else he's been doing in this time of crisis. Yeah, at one level, uh, uh, taking care of all the stakeholders. Uh, and when I say stakeholders, it means not only our immediate employees, but also people who supply us. Uh, there are many small companies who are our suppliers and so on and so forth. So, uh, taking care of stakeholders was our first primary focus and there we went one level, we had to go one level deeper. It was not only about the uh, people but also keeping in mind our Indian living conditions. People have parents who are not well. Uh, there was a peculiar situation where in the lockdown it was even difficult to get medication and so on and so forth. So a lot of activities had to be done around uh, that kind of a thing. So over a period of the thing was to first focus on all the stakeholders. This is apart from the CSR act type of activity that uh, we are involved in, whether it is distribution of rations and so on and so forth. So that was one thing. The other thing was uh, getting people back to 
sort of a step, uh, work, working situation while doing that and uh, uh, i am happy to say that by god's grace we had the strength to be able to pay the salaries of uh, our people and including payments to a lot of our suppliers who are small service providers etc etc right i mean right down to the guy who's supplying you things uh, even for you know like uh, drinking water and so on and so forth basic things uh, so we were able to do that and however in the month of may the situation did become a little tense uh, because uh, the uh, lockdown clarity was not very high at uh, bangalore and we had another added problem because one of our campuses is uh, located on hosur road which is in in karnataka but hardly about a few kilometers from the hosur tamil nadu border so we had a lot of people who you who live in hosur and who work as the part of the meher team and uh, at various levels including at vice president level and also at op- plant operator i mean machine operator level and so on so we had a serious problem because tamil nadu implemented a very harsh uh, kind of lockdown very strict kind of lockdown and many of those people were not able to travel from uh, tamil nadu to karnataka because it's actually a distance of 14 15 kilometers from their house to the plant but uh, they were not able to do it so these were some of the unusual challenges that we had to deal with because of the interstate movement that we landed up facing however i am glad to report that uh, uh, activities are now slowly picking up and in june we believe that we have Uh, reasonably comfortably looking at achieving at least about 40 to 50% of our pre covid performance level uh, so this is at an operational level at a macro level what we decided to do was switch our senior management team actually change the structure of the management team a little bit we formed two groups one is called as survive which will focus on ensuring the survival and well being of the existing uh, businesses and there is another group which we created called thrive Uh, which will focus on the new opportunities that are going to be created post or during this covid scenario and post covid scenario as a result of many things changing social behavior changing discontinuity is happening and so on now the thrive team therefore has been disengaged from the survive team and these guys are looking only at creating revenues from new opportunities with new technologies and we are looking at primarily two areas there one is clean mobility and the other is visualization in the digital space so these are the that's the thrive part of it and that's the survive part of it i would strongly advise those of us who in industry or in any business who are doing it try to break uh, try to split these two teams because the team that needs to look at survive issues is dealing with some very very unusual challenges sometimes they can also go into a little bit of negativity because it's so unpredictable and people have a breaking point sometimes they can get into a depression sometimes they can get little you know uh, okay, uh, despondent so i think that the job of senior management now is to keep the spirits up while ensuring the compassion part that indra and vijay have highlighted uh, if you are a ceo or cxo level company guy today your primary job is to look after to show that compassion and to keep the spirits up apart from guiding people down these tracks and ensuring that at least in the next 6 months all of us come back to at least 70 80 maybe even higher maybe 90% of the pre covid situation thank you shekhar thank you so much sir thank you very much and uh, in the interest of time i will not react to that because there is a lot of reaction very positive reaction which i'd like to give to your comment just like the others but we move to rishi to understand from him yeah shekhar the time is very less so i'll be very fast so we do we completely divide we are a technology company we develop products okay so there are three ways in which i divided the whole organization one which is focusing on the customers who are already using our product so that we ensure that the quality of service doesn't go down so team was working for remote location all the plans which we had made for bcp and dr were on the live mode so you know the plans are <laughs> are getting executed so we are i am happy to inform that you know none of our customer got any kind of issue which we could not resolve and everything was as per the slas we had committed the second team was working on the product road map and getting into different product releases that team there was no um, operational issue everything was product everybody was productive and we kept on releasing a product release cycles as per the plan we had the third one was the customer acquisition team okay initial two weeks everybody was thinking what to do including my exec uh, maybe there are the uh, probable customers but 
I am happy to tell you we have been able to sign four large deals. We have been able to start 10 new pilots during this time. We had to work and think differently. We had to install a device in a machine. Okay. So we had to create a video and a checklist to tell my customer how they can do it themselves. Okay. And so we have been able to become more cost efficient. And I am currently working with my team and leadership team to work on the roadmap for how we'll work on in future to improve our margins, to improve our top line and grow and scale. Okay. So as per work is concerned, we uh, uh, we are thankful to our uh, you know the parent company. There was no need for us to let anybody go for any reduction salary. We continuing continued paying our vendors on time, and uh, we continued paying to all those associated people who work for us on time and whatever they were supposed to get paid. Thank you, Shekhar. Thank you so much, Rishi. And so I'd like to close this by saying only this: what I got out of yes, most of us. Yeah, this yes, is a sir. piece of parting advice to everybody uh, from a traditional Kannadiga guy that is like myself. Please drink more rasam. Please have more rasam and rice. You'll be safer from the corona. <laughs> well, thank you for that advice, <laughs> Mustafa sir. Uh, so finally, what I got out of this, and I'm sure each one of you have got it differently, but what I got is pause, stop, reflect, clear your mind, look at what are the possible opportunities which are there. There are multiple opportunities as we have heard. There are challenges, of course. but those challenges can be managed. Look at what, change your mindset. Think, start thinking differently because the paradigm has changed. And therefore, there is no way that you cannot get back on track. It might take a little time. It might have, it, you might, the going might be rough. But this is probably a point of time where there are multiple new opportunities which are opening up. And the mindset of the government, the mindset of the ecosystem is all about taking these opportunities and running and making it work. So. Don't get despondent. This is the time to actually make things work. So with on that note, I'd like to leave all of you. Thank you, everybody. Vijay, sir, you want to say something? Last words? Yeah, last word, uh, Shekhar. I would, yesterday when we were on the call, uh, we received a very open invitation from the government that if anybody has got any big ideas and they want it implemented, then please get it to us. So I would uh, suggest that IIT can act as a curator and if anybody has got any ideas uh, for implementation, we could you know, help uh, take this across to the government because this is the time the government is willing to listen, the government is willing to act and this could be a great opportunity for IIT also to take this and actually help uh, the people who are the smaller business people, the one with great ideas, the startups. And I can uh, lend even my own support in taking this to the government as well as I think we can create a, uh, not just a think tank, but even a kind of VC fund to uh, help these ideas. I'm sure my other friends would be more than willing to support it. Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful, sir. That's, that's something that we'll take on. So thank you very much. Everybody, thank you for your time. It has been a wonderful discussion. It's been very insightful. I'm sure we're leaving everybody who's listening to this with a lot of positivity, a lot of peace on mind, things are possible. Let's move forward on this. And thank you very much for your time. It has been wonderful speaking to all of you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.